Greetings, everyone. I'm Mike O'Hanlon from the Brookings Institution, and I have the privilege of interviewing today Secretary Ellen Lord, the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment, a position she's now held uh, for several years, which is essentially the duration of that position, uh, it having been created a few years ago uh, in a change from previous Pentagon practice for acquiring weaponry. So Secretary Lord, thank you for joining us today. Welcome. Uh, very happy to have you here. As, as you know, in our brief 20 minutes, I'd like to get at your views on three broad questions, starting with COVID, which I know is on your mind and is the acute issue of trying to make sure that the U.S. and the transatlantic industrial bases continue to provide for our men and women in uniform and deal with rising and serious threats, even in the face of various kinds of shutdowns and restrictions. So I really just wanted to begin with a simple question of how is it going? What are your concerns, but also what's going well so far in terms of sustaining the transatlantic and the American defense industrial base? Over to you, Secretary Lord. Good morning, Michael. Thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to really talk a little bit about the security and resiliency of the transatlantic defense industrial base. Um, very, very important to us. So COVID obviously hit us all hard. And from our perspective, the first thing that I did was to make sure we communicated with our defense industrial base to designate them as critical infrastructure. We followed very quickly with our Department of Homeland Security to put out some directives. And interestingly enough, I had the opportunity to talk very quickly to a lot of my fellow national armaments directors um, in Europe um, and around the world talking about what we did and perhaps how their nations could leverage some of the documents and some of the strategies that we used. So what went well was getting people back to work fairly quickly. Um, we started convening daily meetings here at the Pentagon with the Navy, the Army, the Air Force to understand um, the health of the industrial base. And we had a lot of our organizations reach out. I personally reached out to many state governments, to governors, um, also to embassies in Mexico, in India, where we were having challenges and had very, very good receptivity. So then it really turned into how do we make sure we get the appropriate protective equipment? How do we make sure we listen to what the industrial bases issues were? So we stood up um, three times a week teleconferences with um, our industry associations so that they could really echo and amplify the issues they were hearing from their members and so that we could push information. So one of the silver linings here has been really opening up communications both ways. I wondered if you could comment on two specific things. Uh, one of them is you mentioned Mexico. When I had the opportunity a couple of months ago to interview uh, Secretary McCarthy and General McConville of the Army, they expressed a general feeling of uh, confidence that the military was holding up pretty well in the face of coronavirus, but they were worried about the industrial base and specifically mentioned parts that come from Mexico in the context of how hard COVID was hitting there. Uh, we've seen some you know, impressive and good turns of events in regard to Europe and its handling of COVID and the incidence rates there. But I know that in North America, we're still struggling, including Mexico. How is that relationship going? Does it cause you any ongoing concern, the broader defense industrial base relationship with Mexico? Our um, relationship with Mexico has been excellent. We were able um, to work through our State Department in Mexico and reach out to the critical industrial partners that are a part of our supply chain. And right now, I am not aware of any critical facilities that are currently shut down in Mexico. So we were able to bridge that gap in about a three-week time span. Is there a particular concern that's still on your mind? You've, you've mentioned some very effective processes that are brought together stakeholders, facilitated rapid communication. Uh, but beyond the fact that, of course, COVID could hit harder in a second wave anywhere in the world, uh, is there anything else specifically that's most on your mind in terms of a problem that's not fully solved yet or that something that still keeps you up a little bit at night, even if you feel like 
overall, it's sort of a so far so good kind of message. Absolutely. I think one of the silver linings, frankly, to COVID has been the fact that there's a much larger awareness of issues we have with our supply chain being offshore with um, potentially adversarial um, countries. So what we now have is a much larger awareness throughout the U.S. and I think the world as well as to the challenges we particularly have with China. So now we have interest in actually making sure that we understand the fragilities in our supply chain and that we make sure we reshore as much as possible and also have partners and allies supporting us wherever possible. So I think a silver lining is some of my concerns about rare earth um, mineral processing, microelectronics, um, fat fabrication and packaging, we now have a lot more receptivity about the challenges there and a lot more interest in resolving those. Additionally, um, I continue to be concerned about adversarial capital coming in, nefarious M&A activity taking over critical companies here in the U.S. and again with our partners and allies. There's a much, much higher sensitivity towards that now, and I believe we're able to make some progress. When you say reshore uh, certain capabilities, do you specifically and literally mean within the United States, or are you talking more about the broader Western alliance system, just making sure we don't have dependencies on China or other countries that might be adversarial or competitive? So when you say reshore, are you including Mexico? Are you including Europe? Are you including Japan, Korea within that broader definition of reshore? Or do you mean more specifically and literally the United States? Uh, we are starting literally with the United States as um, always in acquisition. Competition is our friend. We like to have at least two sources. We would like one of those, if possible, um, to be domestic because, frankly, we saw the problems with being able to take deliveries from offshore sources. Obviously, with Canada and Mexico, that's not as much of an issue. Now, I want to be careful when I say this because because we do depend on many, many EU countries for a lot of critical technology and their North American um, subsidiaries have contributed very significantly um, to our efforts. I think a couple examples of those are Leonardo contracts for ground vehicles, for instance, um, Finn Kinteri's, um Frem design for the US Navy um, next generation frigate, a lot of fantastic work going on between the U.S. and Norwegian companies, um, bringing advanced missile technologies, including the Naval Strike Missile, um, to the U.S. inventory. So a lot of critical work there. We just found that particularly with microelectronics, we have gotten ourselves into a potentially compromised um, position where we have U.S. intellectual property in terms of designs then going going offshore um, for fabrication and packaging, leaving us with some vulnerability there that is unacceptable moving forward. Thank you. Since we have such a nice opportunity here to talk with European colleagues uh, and you know, we're sort of taking stock of where we are, not only with COVID, but with the broader national defense strategy in the United States you know, in the summer of 2020, I wondered if you wanted to offer any reflective thoughts on what you've been able to accomplish so far in your tenure there as the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. There have been a lot of new initiatives, of course, in recent years, starting with the legacy of John McCain and Congressman Thornberry as they created or you know, split up the old office and created your position. Uh, then, of course, we've had the National Defense Strategy under former Secretary Mattis that Secretary Esper says he's trying to implement. Uh, there's been a greater focus on great power competition, certain specific kinds of technologies, certain kinds of vulnerabilities as well. I just wondered if you would take a moment to take stock of what's been accomplished, uh, which enduring challenges you still think we need to look at hard as an alliance and as a country. 
Absolutely. So everything we do is under the framework of the national defense strategy. And there are three lines of effort. The first is lethality. We are war fighters. We need to deliver capability downrange. That's our customer. Secondly is strengthening partnerships and alliances. That's a lot of what we're doing here today. The EU, NATO, very, very important to us. And thirdly, we want to reform the way we do business. So I think in acquisition and sustainment, the largest impact we can have is really making sure we speed up and get cost out of the acquisition process. One of the more significant things we have done is to totally rewrite our acquisition system, the 5000 series. And we call it um, the adaptive acquisition framework because we're acknowledging uh, some of the realities of doing business today. For instance, procuring software is very, very different than procuring hardware. Our systems are typically hardware enabled, but software defined. And uh, if you really want want to do um, agile DevOps development versus the traditional waterfall, you need to budget differently for that. So I'm very, very excited that we have a separate software pathway and that Congress is working with us on a number of um, Pathfinder programs where we're looking at a software color of money that doesn't have the same constraints um, as typical money that comes into programs. We're also very focused on cybersecurity, and we've put in requirements for cybersecurity in our development of new systems. We have something that's analogous to ISO for quality. We've put in the CMMC, the cyber maturity model um, certification, where we have a five-year process where we are requiring all of our suppliers to certify their cyber capability to a certain level that is tailored to the system. Those are, are things I think that we've gotten irreversible momentum on and are going to make a big change from a reform point of view and bring lethality downrange to the warfighter more quickly, more effectively. We're sharing all of this with our partners and allies, bouncing ideas off of them. Um, we are benefiting from them. I hope they are benefiting from us. The other thing I'll mention is, again, the security and resiliency of the defense industrial base. We had had a presidential executive order a few years ago asking us to look at the defense industrial base. We developed a report um, on that that gave us really a segmentation of the industrial base and a lexicon for it. Um, not that there's a right or wrong, but it gave us a common vote vocabulary. And what we began to do was systematically look at those fragilities to make sure that we increase our industrial capacity and capability, either here in the U.S. or with partners and allies, to make sure we were not dependent on our adversaries. And frankly, um, COVID has shown a very, very bright spotlight on that. And as I mentioned earlier, allowed us to accelerate that. And in fact, the work that we've been able to do to be very quick and agile in acquisition was very much leveraged during this um, COVID um, crisis by Health and Human Services and FEMA, where we stood up what we call the Joint Acquisition Task Force, a team um, of ours from ANS and then with detailees from the services. And we've gone in to help procure all the personal protective equipment, um, pharmaceuticals. We have um, done major investments in the defense industrial base, as well as the medical industrial base to make sure we have have that capacity we need and to build up our strategic national stockpile. Thank you. My last question for you today, and I'm very grateful for the time you spent with us. I know every, everyone else is as well, has to do specifically again with the transatlantic defense relationship. You've already commented on some of the technologies that we've benefited from receiving from European partners or acquiring and developing together with them. I wondered if you could take a broader perspective and just look from your vantage point at the overall state of NATO and the US, uh, EU and US Europe relationships writ large. This has been a period of you know, turbulence in a lot of ways. There has been an increased ability to devote resources to defense, but many European partners remain below their NATO goals. There's been a fair amount of progress in developing 
defenses for the Baltics, but there's still a perception that you know, Russia is a problematic actor and could be threatening, especially on the eastern side of NATO. So when you combine your specific acquisition responsibilities with this broader strategic picture, what are your observations about the health of the transatlantic security partnership at this juncture? I think mill to mill, we have a very, very healthy relationship. I'm fortunate um, to be able to typically travel to Brussels twice a year for the conference of national uh, armaments directors within NATO. That allows me to be in Brussels and visit my EU counterparts as well. Um, we typically have um, very, very productive bilats while I am there. And we talk about everything from countering Chinese influence to how we're modernizing our acquisition systems to cooperative technology. And there is an enormous amount of cooperative technology um, work going on. We have a couple billion dollars in programs right now. We have invested in grants about another billion dollars or so. We also um, have about a billion dollars in procurements um, from the Army and Navy where we actually signed end use agreements. Um, so we are certifying that the US government will comply with those nations export control requirements. So it's a very healthy dynamic relationship. And um, I think that there's more to be done. I listened very briefly to the end of the last panel and I know Clark Cooper was commenting on EDF and PESCO. I do feel strongly that we have work to do to make sure that the best technology gets to our partners and allies. We appreciate what we get from the EU. We want to make sure that US defense industrial companies have that same ability to participate in the EU market to make sure our partners and allies um, can benefit from that. Because what differentiates all of us when we go to war, we go to war together, we need to be interoperable. And unless we're working on these systems together, um, we will not be interoperable. Very, very important for our future. Secretary Lord, thank you very much for your service to the country, for the time you spent with us today, and really for framing a discussion we're now going to follow on with. But I wanted to uh, wish you the very best and again, express gratitude on behalf of everyone involved with this conference today. So I wish I could applaud more properly, uh, but please accept <laughs> my thanks and best wishes. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate the opportunity. Bye now. Okay, goodbye. So now we will move directly, uh, allowing, of course, for anybody who needs to get their cup of coffee from their kitchen or whatever, I'll, I'll drag out the introduction long enough for you to go ahead and do that. But we are going to move directly into an excellent panel, and you'll want to get your coffee quickly because it's going to be good. And we're going to pick up with reactions to what the Secretary has just said, but also in the context of the current COVID crisis. And this panel has been entitled Defense Spending and Capabilities After COVID-19. So we're also thinking about where the world and the Alliance may be headed in 2021 and beyond if we're thinking about an after COVID-19 world. So I'm really gonna just open the floor up and we're gonna go down through our four speakers, General Claudio Graziano, who's the chairman of the EU Military Committee, who will be followed by Timo Bissonen, the Director General for Defense Industry and Space at the European Commission. And then Jiri Sadivi, the Chief Executive of the European Defense Agency. And then my friend here in Washington, Kelly Maximin, who's the Vice President at the Center for American Progress. And we're gonna ask each of the four the same question, which is, well, it's, it's actually a couple of questions and they can go where they wish. How do you wanna to react to anything you heard from Secretary Lord? How would you assess the overall state of the transatlantic security and defense cooperation relationships at this juncture in 2020? And then again, with the panel's title, how do you envision defense spending and capabilities evolving after COVID-19 or as we process what COVID-19 has done to the economies, to the fiscal situations, to the threat calculus, and to the transatlantic relationships uh, of all the countries that we're talking about today. So that's a big, big set of questions. And I'm really just gonna invite each of the panelists to take four or five minutes to speak to whichever parts animate them and um, you know make them the most passionate. After that, we'll have a brief 
follow on amongst ourselves before we take a couple of questions from the broader audience. So without further ado, uh, General Graziano, if I could turn the floor over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Michael. And uh, I salute all the panelists, starting from Under Secretary Lord that I know if it is still uh, with us. And I will start saying that I will speak on the, as a chairman of the European Military Committee, let's say on the side of the end of users, uh, on the side of the military, on the operational uh, part. And so uh, what is uh, the operational effect of the development of the capabilities and transatlantic relation. Of course, I start from uh, the pandemic that I think the real effect of the pandemic are yet to be defined completely and completely understood, particularly in regard to defense and security dimension. Uh, I will start saying that the geopolitical scenario will not be safer than before. On the contrary, we will face uh, the old challenge amplified by uh, the new crisis, amplified up the worsening scenario. So uh, global fragility, regional tension, activity by malignous actors, hybrid threats, disinformation, and since uh, after the COVID, we understand that we relate a lot on the cyber, uh, the fragility of the cyber system. Uh, this uh, conference I think is very appropriate because 2020 is going to be a crucial year uh, in uh, uh, European Union for defense uh, and security, for its credibility, and accordingly uh, for the de development of partnership and cooperation also in the transatlantic uh, uh, domain. Now, European Union has to demonstrate its cohesion and ability to influence global wise and to act as a security provider uh, through the mission and operation or uh, with the partners, first NATO, uh, United States. In addition, to reinforce its resilience and to step up the development of the necessary capability. Uh, we also to, to remember that uh, while we debate, uh, our opponents uh, are taking advantage of uh, any delays uh, and filling gaps we are uh, leaving empty with malign activities. So starting with the first consideration that is about defense spending, if the risk uh, that can drop or be cut, I think the, right, the risk exists, uh, but must be avoided. Uh, so we should avoid that European defense budget get infected by the virus. Uh, that is because uh, uh, I think, honestly, in my long military career, as the most senior general and the highest ranking general in Europe, so in my long career, I know that there are no poor military solutions to the crisis, but no crisis can be solved without the military means and without the military components. So uh, in terms of defense spending, I know that is mainly national responsibility. But it's important that at this point, uh, the member state uh, financial initiatives are going to converge as much as possible in European common defense initiatives in order to take advantage of the project and the tools, the financial tools uh, the Europe can uh, develop. In addition, if you cut the budget, normally they are going to be to affect uh, the two main uh, pillars of the global strategy of European Union and uh, that is related to all the country, because the first cut will be probably uh, to the capacity of conduct operation and mission, CSDP, of growing level of ambition. And the second is the investment in the investment sector, sector, making more difficult the capability development. As I said, now European Union is promoting stability with both soft and hard power, understanding the need of hard power, and any cut in defense is going to affect the uh, the hard power, and that is to be avoided. So uh, there are also discussion, and uh, we are going to discuss tomorrow in the short meeting, uh, whether part of national defense budget, let's say, could find a safe haven via strong commitment to international cooperation, particularly within framework of European initiative. And that is said is to be considered very important. Uh, and the pandemic has also shown that Europe, European Union need to be more resilient. So there is also the possibility that with, within the recovery fund uh, could consider the defense industry eligible to preserve key technology and therefore protect uh, their sovereignty. That is something we expect a lot. 
Now, of course, uh, what capability uh, European Union needs, uh, it's a, a, a whole spectrum, uh, because actually uh, we are uh, looking forward to have a whole spectrum of the uh, capacity to run operation and mission, uh, both uh, independently and in autonomy when uh, is the case, or in partnership, and uh, to be more credible also in partnership, it's important to have uh, uh, all the capacity that are needed. So the first set of uh, uh, capacity capability we need is the one we, had, we have identified uh, with the critical shortfall uh, in, uh, in what we call high impact capability goals. Uh, the undersecretary refer to the American priority. Uh, for us, it's uh, uh, the domain of information, engagement, deployment, uh, protection, and sustainment. So are more or less uh, uh, close, uh, looking more to uh, crisis uh, management because collective defense is more in the area of NATO. In addition, we look forward to developing and acquire capability to, from lesson identified from re recent operation and crisis and also from COVID-19. And we are speaking, for example, for military mobility, that is a key element also in the transatlantic uh, relation, the European Medical Command, logistics and transportation, healthcare, disaster relief, relief, fight against cyber malicious acti uh, activities. And I was also to point out the problem of disinformation, the disinformation campaign. It was underlying run uh, by country, by uh, Russia, China, etc., that require a new approach also in the cyber defense uh, to reinforce the resilience, because the more we are, con we are uh, relying on the cyber uh, dimension artificial intelligence, the more we have to focus in this uh, new battle space. Now, as you know, to achieve this objective, European has a completely set of toolbox, CAR, PESCO, that I think that Giri and Timo are going to speak more directly about this. NDDF, European Defense Pound. Uh, now I will uh, uh, see it uh, from the end user perspective even if it has a strong uh, defense industry profile. Uh, but I think that is, uh, I mean, really uh, something that can support uh, the capability development of our, uh, our forces. And the moment we are trying in reality uh, to have capability able to cover our shortfall and to contribute to reduce the diversity of platform and system across our armed forces. We are dealing with the United States that have only one kind of main battle tank. In European Union, we have many uh, main battle tank. And if we converge in a single one, it's better. We have uh, many kind of uh, airplane, et cetera. And our research and development base is less uh, developed at this point. Uh, this EDF found are probably uh, the most important things we can see. Uh, to uh, increase the, the, the strategic autonomy of the European U Union and make more credible in the interest of the European Union, but at the end of the day, is in the interest also of the partners because the stronger our, our industry in development, the better we can cooperate at the high technological level. And you consider that on the military point of view, we need always to, to have the technical, technological advantage on the adversary. That is uh, absolutely mandatory for our protection and for our uh, for our soldiers. Thank it's you, very important that we have going to ensure the coherence among all these projects and to encourage member states to take full ownership of the European project by embedding this initiative into their national defense planning. Now, if you have still uh, some... You know, I'd, I'd rather come back to you. I'd rather come back and okay. follow up. But, so thank you very much for that excellent framing of the uh, situation from the European perspective. And now I'd like to go to Mr. Pisonen uh, for his thoughts, please. Timo Pisonen, probably still muted. Timo, are you there? Otherwise, Jiri, please uh, get ready in the wings because I'll come to you next if we've lost Timo somehow. 
Okay, let's go to Jerry, and we'll come back to Timo if he can reconnect in the meantime. Jerry, over to you, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael, and uh, good afternoon or morning still uh, for you. And uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to join this debate. And uh, first of all, a very quick reaction uh, to uh, what uh, Under Secretary Lord said. And uh, I 100% agree that uh, the, the key uh, uh, thing to uh, preserve and strengthen and enhance is. Uh, Interoperability, interoperability uh, between European and 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 and, and U.S. Uh, U.S. Uh, forces, and indeed, to this uh, we need to uh, enhance uh, industrial cooperation, uh, uh, our dialogue and cooperation and collaboration, perhaps also in the area of technologies and especially of uh, of uh, uh, disruptive technologies that are going to redefine uh, the uh, the. Uh, 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 character of warfare, but also indeed uh, very much influence the way how we look at uh, the uh, development of our capabilities. Now, uh, let me say a few words on defense spending. Uh, and here I would like to emphasize uh, three points. Uh, first of all, uh, the uh, downward trend in defense spending which was triggered by the 2008-2009 financial and economic crisis, uh, was reversed in 2014. Uh, and indeed, it was the Russian aggression against Ukraine and the rise of Daesh. Uh, the, 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 those were the game changer, causing significant deterioration of Europe's security situation. Now, in many cases, member states uh, adjusted their national plans accordingly and committed uh, most of their resources to major uh, projects and programs, as far as we can see it, uh, up until the mid-2020. Second point, we are only now actually back at, at the level of the 2007 spending in uh, aggregated terms in Europe. No surprise that member states use their increased national defense investments to mitigate first national deficits caused, caused by uh, budget cuts, uh, resulting from a decade of lower spending in previous years. And third important point, uh, the 2016 EU uh, global strategy uh, represents also a reaction uh, to the change security environment and the EU defence initiatives, namely the coordinated uh, annual review of defence, CAR, PESCO and indeed uh, the European Defence uh, Fund uh, that were launched 2017-18 or came at stage uh, uh, recently. Uh, this was also part of those uh, reactions uh, that uh, actually uh, we've seen since 2014. Now, uh, in light of the looming economic crisis, uh, um, I, I'm afraid that defense investments uh, will certainly have to cope with increased fiscal pressures. And now what we need to avoid uh, is uh, uncoordinated cuts, as we experienced uh, that 10 years ago, uh, and often then uh, across the board, i.e. without proper prioritization. Uh, and uh, we have uh, one big difference today uh, comp compared to the situation uh, 10, years, 10 years ago. We have uh, uh, political instruments uh, that we can leverage. On NATO side, uh, uh, there is the defense investment pledge. And indeed, on the EU side, uh, those uh, instruments mentioned already, PESCO, uh, CART, EDF. So I believe that this, these instruments should serve uh, for us as a prioritization, um, um, uh, a prioritization tools, but also uh, uh, I believe that they should, to a certain extent, protect defense uh, uh, budgets. And last but not least, uh, when we speak about European Defense Fund, uh, uh, this should, see, should be seen also as an a instrument not only uh, to catalyze a collaborative technological innovation, but also actually to support uh, economic uh, recovery. Now, uh, uh, together, uh, these instruments help member states to support the EU level of ambition, but this is also directly supporting NATO objectives as the development of the member states' single set of forces, and I'm speaking about those that are both in NATO and, and EU, will ensure that they can contribute uh, their fair share to NATO. Uh, although the respective uh, EU and uh, NATO defense planning processes are different in nature and objectives, it is essential to, uh, to avoid that uh, they produce uh, 
conflicting or contradicting directions for national defense planning. And this is why, uh, together with NATO, we strive for coherence of output between EU and NATO defense planning processes. And uh, perhaps last point, and it was already repeated several times, with COVID crisis, the traditional geopolitical competition has not gone away and in some cases even was sharpened. Uh, therefore, allies uh, and member states alike should continue investing in defense, investing in the full spectrum of high-end capabilities. And indeed, this is a message that we need, uh, that we need to communicate jointly with NATO colleagues to our respective parliaments and constituencies. Thank you. Very good, thank you. I think I'll go to Kelly next and then come back and see if we have reestablished connection with Timo. So Kelly in Washington, over to you, my friend. Great, uh, thank you, Michael. Great to be here uh, with all of you on this uh, important topic. Um, just a, a couple of quick reactions to Secretary Lord's uh, remarks, as well as some of the remarks made on the panel. I do think that we are really very much on the front end of the COVID impact on not only our national security strategy, but our defense strategy and also the transatlantic relationship. And so I think, you know, it's too early to make some, you know, serious conclusions, but I certainly think that there is a lot of deep thinking and reorientation going on both within the United States and, and within Europe about what the purpose of our military is, what the purpose of our defense strategy should be. And I think COVID brought to light some serious questions awesome. about prioritization um, not just in terms of funding um, of, of defense, but also the direction of defense and the focus of defense and what the military should and should not be able to do. And I think that's most likely also happening in Europe at the same time. Um, I, you know, I agree that there is going to be significant funding pressure uh, going forward. We're, you know, the United States and Europe are looking at significant GDP uh, contractions uh, going forward. I think the economic downturn is going to be likely to be very severe, especially in the United States, if we continue to see the trajectory of COVID on its impact here. So I think there will be certainly be downward pressure on defense spending going forward, um, probably more severe than it would have been otherwise, but I think it was gonna happen regardless of whether or not COVID came into place. So I think it's really a moment for the United States uh, and Europe to start really thinking creatively about, uh, about how we effectuate common defense, um, whether it's through the NATO Alliance or through the partnership with the EU. Um, and I think it's a chance for us to think very creatively about it. Um, I also think, you know, it's appropriate for Europe to be doing some soul searching uh, on how it envisions its own defense. Um, and I don't think we need to shy away from the taboos of EU versus NATO. In fact, I think we need to take them on uh, directly. I, in my view, I think it's, uh, you can have a strong EU defense and a strong NATO alliance. In fact, I think they're mutually reinforcing uh -oh. for our strategic objectives. Uh, it's not a zero-sum choice anymore. In my view, it's it's the only choice. EU integration and strength is going to be essential um, for the United States going forward, especially in an era of heightened competition. Um, I think initiatives like PESCO um, shouldn't necessarily be considered hostile to U.S. interest. I think that the United States needs to be thinking about these issues very differently uh, going forward. I think the key, as many of the panelists have remarked, and as well as Secretary Lord has said, is, is good coordination. Um, to ensure complementarity, interoperability, uh, et cetera. But I think that can be achieved um, much more directly. In terms of what I think, uh, I think there are some serious decisions for the EU to make, um, both with respect to integration, um, with respect to the budget we just touched upon, but also really just the, what is the, the common view and definition of strategic autonomy? What is the vision and, and threat assessment that the EU sees um, and is there a common, common view of that, um, even within the European Union? I think that is going to be essential to driving uh, defense priorities and spending going forward in a way that makes strategic sense, not just in the context of the transatlantic relationship, but also in the context of Europe's defense. So I think that's a real you know, first order question uh, that I think many in the EU need to answer. I think we need to be thinking creatively about uh, more cooperation on research and development uh, in key technological areas, um, especially as it relates to competition with China. Um, I, I happen to believe that this is gonna be the, the real game changer. Um, and so it's not just really about legacy systems and, and integration of systems or trying to figure out how to get to one battle tank. I think we need to be thinking very differently about 
uh, the kinds of uh, capabilities and systems that are going to be essential going forward. I also think the EU has a role to play um, that NATO maybe can't play. Um, so whether it's on uh, disinformation, information operations, as mentioned earlier, cyber related issues, uh, et cetera, there may be places where the EU actually has a better advantage uh, than the NATO alliance on certain security issues. So I think, you know, there's a lot on the table. Um, I think it's a moment for um, an opportunity actually for the US and, and the EU to really try to define some common interests and ways to both deconflict, complement, uh, and augment each other's uh, collective uh, defense capacity. Thanks, Michael. Kelly, thank you very much. And now, Timo, thanks for your patience. And over to you, my friend. Thank you, Michael. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry, I had some technical problems, which actually speaks in favor of my idea of originally to be in Washington today to physically join the conference. So maybe this was my destiny to have a problems. And I would like to spend the weekend at the National Park watching the Nats uh, play maybe against the Yankees, my favorite sports and my favorite teams. I have three points to make. First, on the, on the no, COVID-19. don't hear you. Sorry. You don't hear me. You still don't hear me. I was hearing you throughout myself very you well. You heard, but the others not. Kelly, you heard me? You can, you can hear me now? Okay, you continue. Yeah, okay. I you go ahead, unless I hear from uh, uh, Philippus or someone else that there's a problem getting out to the audience, I think you should probably go ahead. Okay, you, you can hear me? Can you yes. hear me? Yeah. Right. So on the, on the, on the Corona-19 pandemic, of course, it has deep consequences for the European defense industry. What we estimate is a drop of uh, turnover in the defense sector between 10 to 20 percent. Companies have also a serious liquidity problems. And given the long-term program cycles, the full impact, we will only know in a few years' time. I think we need to draw lessons from the past. Ten years ago, we had the financial crisis uh, after the Lima Brothers collapsed, and it took more than a decade to recover for our defense industry. That we cannot afford. The current geopolitical re geopolitics requires a robust defense. Also, the European citizens, and I think the same in the U.S., the people expect that we should do more uh, to protect uh, them and to protect the, 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 our assets. Secondly, on the, on, the, on the European Union today, we have a triple challenge. We want to be greener, more digital, and more resilient. The corona crisis has shown that the over-dependencies on global supply chains is a major risk for our value chains in case of a disruption. For defense, the answer for resilience is the European Defense Fund. It, it has key three principles. First, strategic. We want to invest in technologies, equipments that will make a difference for the, for the Union. Co-funding, catalyzing joint investment rather than substituting national spending and competitiveness. Uh, selecting the industry in Europe that delivers the best product. We want to be inclusive. We want to have uh, companies from all member states and also from our partners. There is also a strong focus in the EDF on the medical response and the rescue as a team for funding as of next year. It's one of the lessons learned after the corona hit us. So this covers priorities like medical intelligence and new solutions for medical treatment facilities. My third point, resilience is not about protectionism. The case for close cooperation between EU and NATO, exactly as Mrs. Magnusson Gelly said, is even more accurate with the corona than before. 22 EU member states are NATO members. There is one single set of force. European Defence Fund has positive, a positive effect on EU-NATO relationship. There are more capabilities for member states it means more capabilities for NATO. EDF capabilities are not owned by the European Union, but by the member states. So they are also available for the European and NATO allies. It contributes also to transatlantic burden sharing in defense, to reach the NATO targets of 2% of GDP in defense spending. EDP is not com commercial driven, but security driven. As long as security-based conditions are met, 
there's background noise in the YouTube feed. Good partners can uh, participate. A colleague of mine says. It's a good example, actually, in the precursory program EDIDP. We have engaged in a very uh, close and useful technical discussion with our US colleagues along the line what I agreed with the Secretary Law a year ago in our exchange of letters. It has proved that we are, the EDF is not protectionist. Huh? The entity is controlled by third countries like US, can take part uh, of the industrial consortia. There's an eligibility criteria assessment, and if they are found eligible, they can receive funding. And this has been the case in this precursory program. What I want to say is that EDF and the emerging European Defense Industrial Cooperation it doesn't make us less transatlantic. On the contrary, it, we stay transatlantic while we become more European here in Europe. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pasonen. And now I'd like to come back to the panel. And we've got about 10 more minutes, which I think realistically is just gonna be time for everyone to have one more intervention. And so what I'm going to do is essentially put just a couple more questions before you all and start with the general and ask to go in the same order with your additional comments and any, you know, concluding remarks, uh, which will all be woven into one two minute intervention. But of course, you can feel free to react to what you've heard from anyone else. Uh, you could also follow up as the general wished to about some other issues that are not yet even addressed where he had some uh, additional points he wanted to make. And then finally, uh, there is a question incoming from uh, someone in the audience about whether the United States Congress and perhaps also European governments and European Parliament are providing enough additional resources to keep the subcontractor base going through COVID, the second, third, fourth tiers. The question uh, that I got in regard to the American Congress specifically was that apparently a House Appropriations Subcommittee has only provided a very modest amount of money measured in the hundreds of millions of dollars for uh, the subcontractor base of defense industry. When Secretary Lord and Secretary Esper had previously re requested $10 billion or more. So less than 10% of the funding, are there concerns there? And then my last question, which you can address or not as you see fit, is could someone uh, take the very broad points that we've been discussing and give me an example or two of specific types of weapons specific types of command and control, missile defense, uh, some area of defense cooperation that's a top priority for NATO and the EU, where you still have a point you want to make about what we need to get done together. In other words, a burning priority, a top priority, that even if we have some good mechanisms in place, we have a good spirit of cooperation, uh, we, we agree we need to stay together. Um, I would like to hear you translate those broad uh, and lofty aspirations into a concrete policy agenda and sort of a hardware acquisition agenda. If there's any particular place in defense capability that you feel we need to really work hard to get better in the next few years. So that's my final question. But again, feel free to address whichever parts of this broad subject are still of greatest interest to you. About two minutes each, please, starting with the general. And, uh... I will try to stick with your question, uh, starting with transatlantic relation and NATO, European Union, United States. Also, enlighten what enlighten what uh, Timo was saying that is extremely important about the single set of forces, and the fact what is good for European Union is good for NATO, and if it is good for NATO, is good for the partnership. So, uh, what we are building or we are trying to building uh, in the European uh, defense industry and the European defense. Uh, capability are going to reflect and to mirror in NATO because at the end of the day I've been a NATO officer all my life, commanding brigade in Afghanistan or United Nations force in Lebanon. And at the end of the day, were the same forces were deploying in different uh, in different uh, arena. And also uh, following what was asked by Kelly about the strategic autonomy, I think strategic autonomy is the key point that uh, makes possible and better the partnership and transatlantic relation and relation with NATO, because that means that Europeans want to be credible, a credible security providers in running operations alone when it is the, uh, when it is appropriate or with partner to run operation, you must be credible. 
with a credible set of forces. So in the meantime, you are becoming what is a long-standing request by NATO, by United States. So to increase uh, the efficiency in uh, NATO, it to become a real pillar. And that is the capability development uh, uh, arena. And uh, we had the now COVID. COVID is uh, a great challenging. It's a great, uh, but we have to transform it also in opportunity. I have spent a lot of time speaking with all the chairs of NATO, European Union partners, how to deal with this uh, issue. And the medical strategic evacuation, uh, the biocontainment, uh, uh, the protection, uh, the role to hospitals, the medical capability, and the ability to run a cyber operation under crisis and in, uh, uh, you know, it's in a malicious system is something we have to work. And uh, if a new wave of COVID will arrive, we will not be excused not to have work enough in this particular sector and not to be ready since uh, at the end of the day, uh, United States, European Union, if you put together the budget, uh, the capability and the technology can be really at the sparkhead of the security in the world. Coming, what is the possibility uh, to have project together with NATO European Union? Honestly, things more or less everything. Uh, you have to consider that we are speaking two different elements. NATO is a military alliance. Uh, European Union is a sovereign national organization that can make law and finance uh, system. So we can finance European Union, something that is useful for both. When you come to the ground system, and we are speaking about the main battle tank, that is I am an army officer. Of course, this one is one uh, of the priority. And of course, it is needed uh, in limited quantity for CSDP operation, a new, probably a new kind of, uh, of system ready to be deployed, etc. But it's also for uh, collective defense. And after that, there is sixth generation airplanes, uh, maritime patrol uh, systems, and many others that I requested. Starting what CIS, so a command and control system and communication, that for us means the ability to run a small operation from uh, uh, MPCC from Brussels uh, in cooperation, maybe with NATO when it's possible. You know, that is the moment we are not applying Berlin Plus. So we have to be the, the reality, we, have, we need to be credible in our operation with the communication system and the cyber system. That is again something that is. Uh, in, this, in the spirit of the single set of forces. Fantastic, General. Thank you very, very much. Now we'll just go back to our original order. And so Timo, we'll go to you next, please, for one to two minutes of your final thoughts. Thank you, Michael. Uh, very briefly, I think what is important is what already referred by uh, Secretary Lord, the cyber and the hybrid threats. I think we need to work together, the transatlantic cooperation on those issues and also on the fight against disinformation, as Kelly pointed out. But I want to make one final point from my, my, from my point of view, is a transatlantic interoperability. We may have different uh, armament systems, equipments, different value chains, but what matters on the ground, when our soldiers are there, that they can combine forces and, and, and fight together in an interoperable way. Excellent. Thank you very much for your final thoughts and your brevity and your uh, hard-hitting recommendation. Jiri Sedevi, over to you, please. Now, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, indeed, first of all, I, I completely agree uh, with what Kelly said. Uh, we should see uh, uh, the uh, European, US, uh, NATO, EU cooperation as a, as a win-win, uh, definitely not as, as a zero-sum game, uh, seeking complementarities synergies, uh, coherence is the key word, coherence of, of, of output. And, and this is something that we do on uh, almost daily basis uh, uh, between our uh, European Defence Agency and respective uh, interlocutors in NATO. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, actually uh, coordination and staff to staff talks and, and uh, to, uh, to uh, not to du duplicate, to complement to, uh, to also follow same standards. This is extremely important. Standardization is one of the uh, actually uh, most, um, uh, I would say, uh, frequent traffic uh, between, between us. So this is what we do on a daily basis. But uh, uh, there are several, uh, uh, actually many, but I would highlight several um, uh, capability areas where we uh, coordinate, uh, for example, 
uh, the indeed military mobility, uh, which is also a big challenge, cyber, uh, air-to-air refueling. Um, um, uh, we do a lot of coordination concerning training, education, counter IED, uh, drones, uh, the uh, or in general terms, uh, the those remotely, uh, uh, those remotely. Um, uh, 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 remotely uh, vehicles that are remotely uh, directed, etc., uh, etc. Et but uh, if there, is, if if I should uh, uh, emphasize one uh, area which is a big challenge, so uh, in terms of interoperability, I it's it's related to uh, to indeed technologies. It's it's related to a new level of connectivity or connectivities uh, uh, between. Uh, various systems on one hand and on the other hand, indeed, uh, various uh, levels of generations of, plat of platforms. And I believe that this is something uh, that we should really uh, have a look at and have a, a much more R&D uh, cooperation consultations, as, as Kelly put it, because if there is a, some uh, a critical area where we could have uh, no problems, interoperability problems uh, in the future. It's exactly this area. Excellent. Thank you, Jerry. And Kelly, over to you for the final word. Uh, well, I'll just add to many of the, the great points that are already made um, that I think I agree with. Um, I just, bottom line is I think Washington really needs to have a mindset shift uh, when it comes to EU defense cooperation. Um, I think that's going to be essential going forward. Um, you know, the, the security and defense establishment in Washington has long been dominated by NATO related thinking, which is important. And NATO is obviously important. But uh, to the general's point, you know, this is this is serious. We're in a serious new world uh, and we need all the help we can get. And, and a strong EU defense is really good for the United States. So that's like my my main point. But to, to add to the questions that were asked, I would say, you know, I think that the areas where the U.S. and the EU can really cooperate the most are areas of gray zone. Uh, issues like we've discussed around cyber and disinformation. Um, I think there is a special advantage to US-EU cooperation in that area, but also the basics. I mean, there, the mobility issue has been good and the cooperation between the EU and NATO on mobility issues has also been good. Um, and so I think some of the basics also need to be uh, put in place. Um, and of course, on both sides of the Atlantic, we have challenges around readiness um, and working really hard on ad addressing the readiness across both uh, the EU, NATO, and the United States. Well, listen, thank you all for an outstanding panel and for getting so much done in such a brief period and for uh, all the reflections as well on Secretary Lord's comments.